And so, uh, I and we have been working hand in glove uh, for a number of years. And so, the reciprocity is uh, we uh, are happy that they have set up this Rhodes, Rhodes Reading Rhodes Academy for, for Asia. Although the focus is on helping capacity building for developing countries, whereas Rhodes Academy is really kind of a global thing. Uh, so, the, uh, and, the, and the session here, as you know, is two weeks. Uh, ours is three weeks. Uh, we we uh, just don't think there could be enough effort put into trying to educate on the law of the sea. It's a very complicated topic. Uh, it's an important topic. And uh, I come here uh, with having, being an old guy, uh, who was president at the beginning of the negotiations, and therefore was dealing with several issues that I'm going to talk about today and tomorrow. Today, it's the issue of baselines. And one of the things that I learned from uh, having some breakfast and supper with uh, your colleagues was that it's important to speak slowly and that you should understand that some of you know so much and some of you, well, So, I know now how my minister feels when he speaks to his congregation. He has to somehow relate to little children and to very old people. Uh, so, I'll try to, to do my best to make what I give you today as simple as it can be, and yet uh, the topic that we're on this morning, which is based is uh, such a fundamental concept that uh, I think it's important that you understand it. My approach is to let you take the, the lecture with you because what I'm going to talk about is in your, your lighter blue book, uh, the first really 33 articles in the convention, which, uh, by the way, uh, I was with Dr. Robert Hodson, the geographer of the Department of State, uh, a very young uh, lawyer that sort of tagged along with him as we tried to put together the first uh, 33 articles, which we did. These were the first articles that we put together in 1975 as a single negotiated text. So let's, let's begin, let's look first Using your, your book, which is a good place, you'll find on my next lecture, I'm very critical of the uh, it lost judgment because I think they went off on their own rather than following the convention. But that's a story for tomorrow. Anyway, you had an outstanding lecture in uh, uh, James Kraska on the first article of in the territorial sea, so I won't spend any time saying anything about the content of the territorial sea, except that you need to know that the baseline is the point from which all maritime entitlements are measured. And we find that two of the conferences, the first and the second conference, uh, failed really because they're no agreement reached on the breadth of the territorial sea. And now I know you all know that the breadth of the territorial sea embodied in the 1982 convention is 12 nautical miles, measured from the baseline. The outer limit it is provided, as you can see, in Article 4, and uh, then you reach what is the most important thing to take away from this, this lecture. If you remember one thing from each lecture, you really a good student. 
And the one thing you need to remember here is we're talking in the first instance about the normal baseline. And the normal baseline is, in simple terms, really an outline of the coastline. And it, it, it's so short I can read it, the outer, the except or otherwise provided in the convention, the normal baseline for measuring the breadth of the territory of the sea is the low water line along the coast. The low water line is what the coastal state wants to have because that is the, the most projection into the sea. Okay? So it's, it's more land. So that's the normal baseline. It's not enough just to have the normal baseline identified. It has to be indicated on the official charts in a way that's intelligible so you can tell where it is. It, is, it isn't for the coastal states as much as it is for navigators at sea to know where they are in relation to the baseline. Why? Because landward of the baseline is basically territory. It's, it can be internal waters, but it is full sovereignty landward. So it's very important to have the demarcation between the normal baseline and uh, where the uh, territorial sea begins. By the way, if you're, if you're looking at that, that's good. But as I said, my approach, what I'm going to do is go through the, so we call it the, in the law school, they call it the hard letter, or uh, letter of the law. If you take that home with you, and you'll always have it from now on, watch close to your bed, I hope. And you will always be able to refer back to what we're doing in the first bit. I know uh, in the age of cartoons and and uh, video games that you're accustomed to seeing all kinds of wonderful slideshows, but I'm an old guy and I I will give you the pictures afterwards. We will look at the text first. That's what lawyers are supposed to do. And, and by the way, that will be a big deal tomorrow when I talk about the deficiencies that I see in, in the uh, South China Sea Award. Anyway, so you have to have the low water line for the normal baseline as marked on what they term large scale charts officially recognized by the coastal state. So that, that's the single most important thing for you to remember. That in Article 6, it, uh, there's a, a, a provision that we're not going to go into, but it, it's just to say that, that in the case of atolls, the territorial sea is the seaward low water line reef. So they they give a little bit more, as it were, land territory jurisdiction to to uh, reefs. Yes, atolls. Yes. A question about low water line. When you talk about low water line, you refer to mean low water water line. There, there are. If you're getting into stuff that the surveyors over here know about, I'm not going to get into that. There will be different measurements by different uh, survey organizations within different nations on where the low water line is. You're absolutely right about that. Don't confuse your colleagues too much. Okay, let's get, let's get through the let's get through this and and not try to get into that kind of minute detail. May I continue just because okay. Continue with the next article in the plural report. They, they talk about the low tide durations. And they, they say pretty clear that the straight baselines shall not be drawn based on the low tide no durations. So if I associate the low water line to the mean low, low, line, low water. Uh, there is no agreement in the academic community yeah. as to which of the various methods for establishing the low water line is, is to prevail. Uh, but I don't even want to go there. I, I, let's go to the next article. Okay? I, and I don't mean to curtail discussion, but for people that are having their first day of even understanding what, the, what this is, you obviously know a lot already. Okay, but let's look. So we've talked about the 
the coastline measurement, which is the normal uh, baseline. Article 7 brings into artificial baselines. And there, what we have is a reflection of the Anglo-Norwegian fisheries case. That was a case in 1951 decided by the International Court of Justice where there had been a dispute, there was a dispute at that time, between the United Kingdom and Norway. The problem was that in the northern part of, of Norway, there was uh, a uh, dispute over when and where the uh, UK fishermen could fish. The Norwegians make the argument that they had a deeply indented coast, their fjords that go in. They said there are all kinds of islands that fringe off our area. It would be, frankly, very difficult. Some of you are, I know you're, you're a, a navigator. There are navigators that know that it's very difficult in those kind of settings, the factual setting, to know where you are. Now, it's a little bit better in our day because we got these GPS devices. But back in 1951, they didn't exist. So anyway, the, both sides thought they were right. Both sides are sophisticated. And so they went to the International Court of Justice. And, and somewhat to the surprise of the traditional international law people, the court said, the Norwegians are right. It isn't practical to try to have the normal baseline rule applied, which was a historic uh, rule. And so they said that in the geographical circumstances that are in the Anglo-Norwegian fisheries case, that the Norwegians could draw these straight baselines. Well, they embodied in Article 7.1 the holding in the Anglo-Norwegian fisheries case. It says, where the coastline is deeply indented and cut into, or if there is a fringe of islands along the coast in its immediate vicinity, the method of straight baselines joining appropriate points may be employed in drawing the baseline from which the breadth of the territorial sea is measured. So they took the ICJ decision, they took the Hangman or Wizard Fisheries case, and they put it in Article 7.1. Actually, they put it in the 1958 Territorial Sea of Contiguous on Convention, which then put this for presented this verbatim language which the people in the, uh, involved in the uh, third UN conference on the law of the sea put in here in Article 71. And there, there was at that point almost no one that disagreed with that. There were about 50 countries that were parties to the territory of sea in the Tigusum Convention. They were, this was already the existing law for them. Then uh, there was a new innovation in 7.2. I'm not going to go into it very much. It has to do with deltas. Uh, and uh, there, there are certain unusual circumstances. Some of you are probably familiar with the delta uh, unusualness. But uh, again, to try to keep it simple, I'm not going to delve into what that means. Uh, most of you will never deal with a delta. Probably, uh, if you're dealing with baselines, you will have to deal with the normal baseline. You will have to deal with the straight baseline. I don't think you'll have to deal with 7-2. Some more rules that are embodied in the 1982 convention, which 7.3 says the drawing of the straight baseline must not depart from any, in any appreciable extent from the general direction of the coast. And the sea areas lying within the line must be sufficiently close, close, sufficiently closely linked to the land domain to be subject of internal water. So uh, it, it is uh, a, a rather 
straightforward rule, but it's not as easy to interpret always as, as uh, we'll find in state practice. I think all but 10 of the coastal countries in the world have employed straight baselines. Some have been outrageously uh, Applied. Uh, the longest baseline that the Norwegians had was 44 uh, nautical miles. Some have, and some from the countries in, in this room, have had ones that are much uh, greater than that. That, that. that there is a different set of criteria that apply to archipelagic baselines. You'll be hearing from one of the best geographers in the world on this next week. And so uh, I'm not going to try to uh, it in any way, but uh, he will tell you about archipelagic baselines. But there, there still must be that connection. It has to make sense for the area that's landward of the straight baseline uh, to be considered under the sovereignty of the coastal state. Then it says straight, number four, says straight baselines will not be drawn to and from low tide elevations unless lighthouses or similar installations which are permanently above sea level have been built on them or except in instances where the drawing of the baselines to and from such elevations has received general international recognition. Uh, in truth, uh, during the negotiations, the Norwegians that had won the big victory in the Anglo Norwegian Fisheries case were not a party to the 1958 Territorial Sea Contiguous Operation. The reason they were not a party is because they had used some um, straight baselines that began from low tide elevations that technically were not <coughs> under the 1958 Convention. So, um, actually, our geographer. Uh, is, is very famous and very well respected by all the delegations. Uh, and I talked with uh, Per Tressel from, from Norway, uh, who was at that point not a famous ambassador yet. And uh, he said, well, what we have to do is, is fix this some way, and then Norway will be, done, be able to become a partner. And, and so we added the phrase, uh, has received general international recognition, which they had in the anglo norwegian Fisheries case, but hadn't gotten when the language was put together for the 1958 Convention. Um, and then there is a, a another subjective area that, where the method is uh, uh, has to take into account economic interests peculiar to the region. Uh, that is, uh, again, highly subjective and it's fully predictable that the coastal state will be uh, pointing out how important it is to their people to have these uh, baselines and it is also fully predictable that girls that are going to lose their tradition or not even necessarily tradition, but their distant water fishing rights are, are going to be very skeptical of the arguments that will be made. Uh, with respect to 75. Uh, another innovation was that uh, in 76, it says a system of straight baselines may not be applied in such a manner as to cut off the territorial sea of another state from the high seas. And then, of course, in 1958, there was no exclusive economic zone. So the idea here is that straight baselines can't be applied in such a manner that it denies that access to the, the open sea uh, by cutting off the territorial sea access. Uh, and then we have Article 8, uh, which simply provides the rule that Waters on the landward side of the baseline form part of the internal waters of the state. And uh, 
And as I'm sure Professor Kraska told you yesterday, uh, when the, the effect of the straight baseline in that instance is done, then there's still innocent passage uh, in, that, in that area. In other words, it's not territorial sea anymore, but it is deemed to be territorial sea even though it has now become internal waters. So I, I think that's understandable, and uh, so we'll move on. Uh, miles of a river, if the river flows into the, uh, directly into the sea, like the Danube, or many rivers, uh, the baseline will be a straight line across the mouth of the river between the points on the low water line of its banks. So, some of you may in real life deal with that one. The next one is on bays, Article 10. I, I'm not going to get wrapped around an axle on explaining bays. I'll show you some illustrations in the next part of this presentation. But uh, I, I hope that now you're getting a pretty good idea about normal baselines, about straight, straight baselines. Article 11 says, that you're allowed for purposes of delimiting the territorial sea to use the outermost permanent harbor boards, which form an inter integral part of the harbor system. And uh, so this is an exception where you don't really have a, a natural feature, uh, but it is still important to support the state access. Remember, in a port, you're an in you're entering in internal waters, and one of the, the huge uh, jurisdictional extensions that you find in the Law of Sea Convention is that you can condition port, act, uh, port access. And so that gives you a lot of power as a coastal state, and uh, you could say you can't come into our port unless we can inspect your containers and make sure they are you know, carrying contraband or whatever it is that you're conditioning port entry on, uh, you have the power to say to them, hey, you can't come into my territory, just as you can at the border uh, on land. You can say you can't come into my country unless you have a visa or unless you're a politically recognized refugee or something like this. So uh, that that's uh, for ports. Article 12 says road states. Some of you probably have never heard of the term road states, uh, but they are uh, situated in, in many developed areas, offshore, where the bigger cargo ships can come in and tie up, and, and uh, so they are, again, in notice the word normal, uh, that word comes up again when we talk about the normal mode, uh, so uh, the word is in the, in the convention. Interestingly, I think, uh, there is no mention anywhere in the convention by design of the term historic rights. The 501 page opinion that we're going to talk about tomorrow talks about a third of it about historic rights. And this is where one of my criticisms comes in that I think the, the award got away from me. Uh, and got lost when we got away from the text of the convention. Look, sorry. On articles 11 and 12, does uh -huh. it talk more about structures in the uh, port? Artificial side? structures, but are intimate to the use of the port. Okay, so you, I get a baseline from that structure? Yep. <coughs> so are included well. They're, they're included in the territorial sea. So the roads, that's, that's not quite right. You don't get a baseline. But you're able to treat a roadstead, the area that's in a roadstead, as a territorial sea. They, they often cover, some of you, anybody from Singapore or Rotterdam or something? Okay, the, the, the roadsteads can be very large and they can be offshore and they want you to be able to use them, but you have to obey the new rules on innocent passage. So uh, 
the uh, Permanent Harbor Works uh, are, are, are used for uh, delimiting the territorial seat. Uh, the, the roadsteads and the includes the ones that are within them. The uh, Outer Harbor Works uh, are regarded as forming part of the coast. So there, there's a difference between the way they have roadsteads and the way they uh, deal with permanent harbor Do you still always be like a historical uh, structure, not really if I want to build a new one? No, you can build a new one. And that would actually be... Sure. If there is no reference anywhere in the Convention to Historic Rights, it's an absolute quagmire to figure that one out. They talk about it twice historic title. They never talk about historic rights. Anyway, uh, to move on, low tide elevations are defined then in Article 13, which says it's a naturally formed area of land which is surrounded by and above water at low tide, but submerged at high tide. So, as a general proposition, you can't, you got to have dirt, you got to have land in order to have a, a baseline. But, in the case of low tide elevations, if you have one that is located within 12 miles of your area, then you may use it as a baseline, even though it is a low tide elevation. So they, they, they are trying to be very practical about uh, what, uh, what will be used. You're not obligated to use it, but you may use it Coastal states always seem to take as much as they can from the sea, so the probability is pretty high that if you're if you're dealing with trying to figure out your your baselines, that, that there there will be a lot of sentiment in your government for having uh, low tide elevations that are within 12 miles included as base points. Um, and then it just simply says in 14 that you can use any of the, uh, uh, the methods provided for the suit different conditions. And then there is something that in Article 15 that uh, when we talk tomorrow more about the uh, limitation, uh, it, it says if, you, if in the 1958 conventions they had the median line Usually, because the territorial sea was not very uh, very far, and so these are their adjacent states or even opposite states, they split the difference. They just draw a median line. At the conference, there were about an equal number of states that were in favor of this kind of mathematical method. Uh, it seems fair in a way, doesn't it? But then. There were about another equal 50 nations that said, wait a minute, you have to have special cir circumstances taken into account. So we had you know, a conference that's trying to proceed by consensus, and you have about 50 nations that are saying, we want to split the difference like Greece does with our, our friends from Turkey. They say, well, we'll just, you know, we'll just split the difference you're right off our coast. It's not equitable for you to be able to cut us off from uh, access to the Mediterranean and so on. Uh, so they were strong proponents, obviously, of the special circumstances. It became evident to those that were experienced in the negotiations. They were never going to resolve this. Essentially, it was a bilateral problem. You know, two countries are usually two. Couldn't be one. But they're, they're usually there, one's arguing, let's split the difference. You know, this is Japan, these are in China and the Southeast China Sea. Um, and, and China saying, wait a minute, we got this right this trough that's right off the Sakaku Islands and, and uh, just, uh, you know, we just want to look at the surface like a, a bird. And, and actually, I'll tell you a little, I don't want to divert too much, but a few anecdotes are sometimes instructive. There, there was a, 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 a,
limitation between Norway and the UK. The, the head of the delegation for the, for the uh, United Kingdom was a man named Gutteridge. His daughter, Joyce Gutteridge, was uh, one of my supervisors at Cambridge. And I had just studied the North Sea Continental Shelf case. And I looked at the geology and the geomorphology. And I, I went in to see her and I said, I don't understand why essentially you applied the mechanical split the difference. Because the Norwegian trough runs right through, uh, right down the coast of Norway. And that, that under the North Sea Continental Shelf cases, the, it's, it, it's nowhere the, the middle of the ground. Uh, there is nowhere uh, part of the natural prolongation of, of Norway. And she looked at me and she said, young man, what you don't understand is that the Norwegians fought the Germans. So these delimitations can be very political. And by the way, all of Norway's prosperity is coming from these, these areas that they bought from Britain in that deal. So those boundaries are very, are very political. And that's one of the reasons that they don't turn them over to third parties, or they're not supposed to, if they follow the rules. And then the last thing is that Article 16 provides that your, you are to deposit your uh, charts and or lists of geographical coordinates with the United Nations. And so some intriguing questions come up. I think uh, we saw yesterday, what, uh, or I'm sorry, the last lecture, uh, Dr. Mackerel. Uh, what do you do if you're in the Seychelles? And you have uh, an island out there, and the sea rises. And suddenly the island isn't there anymore. Well, different people will give you different answers. My answer is that as long as you have that point uh, on the official chart that you have with the United Nations, even though it's now underwater, it stands if somebody hasn't protested. So that, that's my interpretation. That's just an opinion that I have. Uh, I, and, and part of it is because if you look at the delta provision again, you find that, that they allow these deltas to uh, go out as far as they, they can, because obviously the, the sediments are coming from that uh, area. And then when it recedes, um, they allow the uh, as it goes back and forth, they allow the farthest poles that you can get your point there for the, uh, the, the base point. So they allow you to keep the base points even if they go underwater or are really mud banks. Uh, as long as they've been put out there and are accepted uh, under the convention, uh, they're good. And so I think the same kind of logic applies uh, to a country that has uh, some very important, maybe even islands, but at least base points that go underwater. I think as long as they're on the map, and now with GPS, the navigators pretty much know where they are. And so I, that, that's my opinion, but it, it hasn't been decided anywhere yet. All right, well, let's... Uh, Let's now turn to pictures. This first one is, uh, and by the way, I have cribbed all of these from a lecture that I gave at Rose in uh, 2011 and took almost all of the graphic illustrations from Dr. Robert Smith, who was a former geographer of the Department of State. And, uh, is right up there in the company of Clive Schofield as being a world-class geographer. Um, okay, so you've already seen, you have a territorial sea baseline, we just talked about, sovereign territory, according to the there, 
and then you go out to 24 miles. I won't. I, I think someone else is talking about contiguous zone, right? If, if not, let me just say a couple of words about contiguous zone. The contiguous zone, uh, until it got polluted by uh, overzealous people at the end, uh, has only been an enforcement zone for customs, fiscal, immigration, sanitary matters that infringe on either the territory or the territorial seat. So it, it, it's a re it was really kind of an anti smuggling zone. And uh, so a lot of people didn't even think the contiguous zone would, would be in the convention, but it was listed on the issues, the sub list that they made of subject and issues. And so it was left in. And then towards the end of the, the conference, there were uh, some states that said, hey, wait a minute. We, we are concerned about uh, shipwrecks and archaeological things uh, that, that might be found uh, off the territorial sea. And, and so they said, OK, if, if uh, there are uh, shipwrecks off in, in within the 25, 24 mile contiguous zone, that they will appertain to the coastal state. So that, they, they made something more than it was in, in the customary international law. Um, a lot of people, we like the, the United States being the naval power, we like the idea of a contiguous zone. Uh, because it showed that the EEZ was not just something that the uh, coastal state could do. Other states, you know, were opposed to it for exactly that reason. But anyway, the contiguous zone is there. Uh, so far as I know, there hasn't been an adjudication about it, but it's there. And uh, it, it actually is relevant for whether or not you have uh, the uh, contiguous zone for, for rocks because uh, you might get, then get overlaps, and we do in the South China Sea that you wouldn't otherwise have. So if there's there certainly are shipwrecks out there, and uh, if they go in one of those overlapped areas, you're going to have an interesting issue about who uh, who's uh, shipwreck it is. And then we show the exclusive economic zone. Notice that for the most part, the, the, the exclusive economic zone and the and the continent uh, itself are separate doctrines. Even though every country is deemed to have a continent, a, a continental shelf of 200 miles, if it has an EEZ, but they're separate doctrines. This will, this will be to explain it more by others, but. It's inherent in a coastal state to have its continental shelf. It doesn't have to declare that. It has, it. it's got an AEZ, even though it, it, there's no physical continental shelf there at all. Please. If you claim um, an exclusive economic zone, it's a part where you have a continuous zone, or you have to claim the contiguous zone? Exactly. If so, fact that you have. I mean, you, you don't have to claim it. That is to say, that there may be some creative ways if you're having a boundary issue where you don't really care about the territoriality issue, where you simply say, okay, we're going to have a 24 mile contiguous zone. And, you know, you, you could still take actions against terrorists or pirates or bad guys. Uh, for infringements of your territory, because you wouldn't have a territory to see. You would uh, have enforcement rights uh, in, in your contiguous zone. So there, there, may be, there may be some maritime limitation cases where uh, that com comes up, but I'm not aware that it ever has. Okay, what else? Um, well, then, of course, you're going to have lectures by uh, Thomas Hydar about the, the area beyond 200 um, miles as far as the continental shelf is concerned. 
the, the coastal states had such momentum going that it was a, a very brave soul that would stand up and say, the coastal states are getting too much. And you had various negotiating groups. One of them was a negotiating group uh, for the, basically for the uh, oil companies that wanted to get every drop of oil appertaining to the coastal state. They didn't want to leave anything for the deep sea pit. And they were, by and large, successful in getting get away with that. And uh, they set up a very weak commission on the limits of the continental shelf. They're so far behind in their work now um, that, you know, you can wait 20 years to get a recommendation out of them. Uh, and their, their secretariat is being provided uh, not uh, independently as it is for the International Seabed Authority, for the uh, International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, but it's, you know, uh, Gabrielle, uh, her Division of Ocean Affairs, is, is providing the secretariat for the Commission on Limits of the Continental Shelf. They're not a permanent organization. They still have 21 members, just like they have 21 judges. Our Supreme Court has nine. They have 21. Uh, pardon me? No, 25. No. No, 21. Yeah. Anyway, the point of it is, based on geographical, uh, equitable geographic distribution, well, inherent in that is the idea that citizens are going to vote for their own country, isn't it? Why would you have them equi not equitably you know, distributed it unless you were assuming prejudice on the part of the, the participants? So, anyway, it's, there's another world up there at the UN. I don't know it very well. Some of you are in missions up there. You know all about this stuff. Anyway, then, most importantly, about half the world's left for high seas. So it's not a little teeny area, it's a huge area, which largely accounts for why the fish are in such bad shape for a while. Uh, most of the fish occur within the 200 mile zones. And the management of those fisheries, for those of you that are fisheries experts, you can say it much better than I do. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's always good when the coastal state gets there. But the area then beyond, and that they say no national rights, um, that's not true. But anyway, uh, it's true enough. Uh, so you, anyway, you got the you got the grand picture in your mind, I hope, uh, from all of this. And um, let's see what else we got. This is what I've been talking about. Normal baseline. Coastlines, reefs, low tide elevation, bay closing lines, which I skip, uh, roadsteads, which I don't skip, straight, straight baselines, and then archipelagic baselines, which I'm not going to uh, So, keep uh, going. stuff is, I suppose, I must be going the wrong way. I am. This is not a date. There are now 166 parties to the convention, including the European Union. Um, Switzerland, of course, is a landlocked state, which is kind of interesting that it's part of the convention. North Sea continental shelf cases under this. Land dominates the sea. And, and that, that again is one of those portable ports that you're Calling. Coastal states where it kind of writes the rights of coal. So those are all the articles that we just wrote through. And we'll talk about normal baseline. There they are listed. Hopefully they all make some sense to you. And if not, you Carry your little blue book. Read it again. Low water line. Some people know heavy odds about what is a low water line. It came from 
Article 3 of the 1958 Territorial Sea Contiguous Zone Convention is now embodied in Article 5. Here's an example of a normal, normal uh, baseline. It reflects basically the coastline without any special circumstances. And uh, the, this, this is kind of the point that you're making, that it's not knowing the real location of the baseline can be, uh, this, is, uh, this is my friend Bob Smith's house. I think this was uh, for Columbia that he was doing this. I don't know what this is about, the truth but it was a baseline thing. So uh, here's another one of the bombs deals. Anybody know where Raccoon Island is? Someone must know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You're not ashamed to say you don't know it. Right in 
leaves it. And I said, did you ever have to limit the jury to obey? And he said, no. <laughs> so I don't think most of you will have to worry too much about it. But it, it, it is support, important anyway to know that they're, they've tried to figure out the various uh, geographical features and provide rules for them. Uh, but there's still inevitably ambiguities and that's if, if there's a dispute over where the oil, you don't even have to look where the oil is. You just find out where the dispute is and you know where the oil is. And uh, if you have babies, uh, you can see there are uh, ways that you can uh, apply it. Basically, you stick a stick in front of it and push it in until it gets land on both sides, right? Um, and then you see that the ratio works. The well order bay is
that there were those that wanted to have compulsory jurisdiction for everything, and those that did not, they were trying to conclude for anything, like Russia, that they were trying to conclude the convention. And so they made some grand compromises that you know you personally may think are, are, are bad, and unless you're from a country that wants to have a 200 mile zone around a rock. And uh, so here's uh, some examples. You notice he doesn't use Johnston Island. He was stick to Roman geography, but he couldn't. <laughs> and um, there's rock. Got rock type the name. Looks like it's covered with Milano to me. Uh, but uh, eventually, it's the only case in history that I know about, uh, the Brits uh, basically abandoned in their uh, boundary negotiations with Ireland, because it really didn't matter that much, the idea that that was entitled to a 200 mile territorial sea. So they enclaved it with, well, there's some rocks. They added about a third of the economic zone of Mexico to it by having these rocks included with 200 mile zones. And now, here's the granddaddy of them all, Opi Toroshima. That's a, that's a piece of rock that's about the size of that disc. And uh, they not only, the Japanese have built it, now this is much more advanced, they've got a big dome over it. I, I know they're terrified that it's going to be washed away, but in their continental shelf, Submission. They not only say it has a 200 mile zone, but it has a, 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 a continent shelf. So, how, how that piece of rock could dominate, you know, the, the land is beyond me. But uh, there they are, and they probably had boats that would go out and fight for it. So they're talking about doing other things besides uh, just having it there. Uh, put stuff on. Oops. There you are. Now I think you're going to Clive Schofield. He'll probably show you the same one. Uh, can you imagine being stationed there to guard that rock? There, there's another one. That reminds me. When I was in the Office of Legal Advisor at the State Department in the early 70s, uh, there was a, a brother of Ernest Hemingway that came into the office. And he had a shack like that that he had been living on with two women. I didn't go into the war office. <laughs> and uh, he, he wanted us to recognize that he had established an independent country. <laughs> and I said, well, the only problem is you build an artificial installation on the continental shelf in the Bahamas, and that's illegal. And he was very disappointed in his, you know, usual State Department stiff turned him down from something that any rational red-blooded American would approve. And so, uh, anyway, he went out grumbling away. I, I don't know if this polygamy lasted or not. He never talked to me again. Okay. We're not going to go into this. Um, there's a book we talked about earlier. The case was brought to 49 and settled in 91. By the way, they didn't say they could have a four-mile territory of sea. They didn't opine on that. They were obligated to do so. But that, that gives you some idea of, of what it was like in that case to try to do it without artificial baselines. The scatter act, as it's called.
There you have some examples. These are pictures. I hope they know them better than my inadequate language, but you get the idea when a straight baseline is okay. And it's, it's true, there's no, uh, uh, unlike the archaeologic baselines where they have specific figures that pertain to the lengths of baselines, which by the way were figured out by our geographer, Dr. Watson, at our conference. States takes a, a, a conservative view on baselines, and part of the reason is is that we are a naval partner, and so we want as much of the seas open as, as possible. We argue it's in the international community interest. I hope you're appreciative. That these are these are what we. We had a baseline committee that did the baselines for all of the United States and overseas possessions. And they developed internal criteria, which if you're ever tasked with that by your governments or trying to write a PhD dissertation, uh, it would be good to check on that because there was a lot of uh, research that went into it. So this, this was a, the, the, the fact that, that there was now overlap of these international waterways by the extension of 12 nautical miles. That's, that's the reason that uh, the United States and Britain and Russia, the Soviet Union at that time, were, were so eager to get provisions in there that allowed them to move through these straits. Uh, there were, I think 116 of them over by. That's not my subject today. So these are illustrations of some of the words that I didn't mention. Uh, just one, okay. one, 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 one,
this. You, you can't have a mid-ocean archipelago according to the convention. That's what you're asking. But the atolls, I mean, you would consider them each individual. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't think there is very much support for it being an island. Do you? I mean, name some countries that think it's a okay. I don't know. Yeah, the Chinese and South Korea both protest. They protest Japanese to I, I guess I don't know enough about the protest, but the the the, uh, the, the feature, in my opinion, there isn't a reasonable person on earth that doesn't think that's a rock. Okay, so. That's my opinion. So, so you're asking? I, there's only one feature there. I don't understand what other feature you're talking about. I, Have they created a, a reef around it or something? Well, we continue to be innovating. Uh, we, we can talk about it more. You obviously know a lot more about it than I care to know. Yeah. <laughs> maybe I can say something also about Okina Torishima because I uh, did some research on that. Yes, so it was in 2008 when Japan uh, did a submission um, to the continental, uh, to the CLCS, to make it short. And uh, they claimed from uh, the baselines of Okina Torishima um, 200 nautical miles, exclusive economic zone, continental shelf, and also continental shelf beyond 12, uh, 200 nautical miles. And then it was South Korea and also China that made two note uh, verbal uh, protesting this because they think it's not it's not a it's not an island that has full entitlements, but only a rock that has um, an entitlement to a up to twelve nautical miles of territorial sea. So. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good summary. Yeah, and I I do think it's a, for me it's a rock also because if you compare it to Kitasueño, for instance. It looks very similar, like Kitasueño 32, QS 32, yeah. it looks very similar and I think even though I, I, I disagree also with a lot of findings, findings made by the South China Sea Arbitration Tribunal, um, I can say also that in that case uh, the area, you know, the, the, the area of the, of, the, of the rock matters a lot to know if it's capable of habitation or uh, cap viable for economic life. Well, it, it, I don't know how it can be much of an argument about Itushima. Ituaba, because there have been people there for 60 years. The time of the filing of the case, it was, uh, you know, they had an airstrip, a harbor, a hospital. I mean, it's not a rock like Okitorishima. I think that, I think the, the, the panel, this is, giving you hints on my attitude tomorrow. I think the panel decided that it uh, could not have a 200 mile zone, and it would if it were an island because it would overlap with the 200 mile zone of the Philippines, and therefore they would not have compulsory jurisdiction under Article 298. I think they made a practical <coughs> judgment on it that I don't agree with. Uh, any other, are we about it? When do we stop? Do I Am I already over? I don't know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions?
Okay, thank you very much.